Did you enter Sasha's apartment that night? No. Do you know who caused Sasha's death? No. Did you go to her apartment uh, late, or her apartment building inside late Friday night, early Saturday morning at all? No. Okay. Um, so we watched the cameras. We're not going to see you entering that building at all? Correct. Okay. Did you have any involvement in the murder? No, sir. Do you know who murdered No, sir. Hey everyone, my name is Kevin and welcome. If you're inquisitive and fascinated by true crime, then you've found the right channel. Here at Just Thought Lounge, we examine interesting cases that raise thought-provoking questions. Today we're going to take a look at the case of Sasha Samsudin. It's a bit of a change of pace for us here as our most recent cases have revolved around subpar police investigations and questionable conclusions. Today, however, we're going to take a look at an investigation that successfully examined evidence and persons of interest to piece together the final hours and minutes leading up to the crime, and to ultimately reveal the killer and bring them to justice for the victim, her friends, and family. Sasha Samsudin was a native of New York where she was born in 1988. She graduated from the University of Florida and continued to work in the state in the following years. She worked for an education firm managing their social media accounts and was active and passionate about the real estate and apartment rental market in and around Orlando. She was a volunteer with Apartment Association and did social media work in this area as well. Sasha was known to be excellent at her job, bubbly and fun, with a large social circle of caring and supportive friends. The evening of the 16th of October 2015 was a Friday night and Sasha had plans for a night out on the town. She spent time at a spot called Sidebar before moving on to a nightclub called The Attic, where she stayed until about 12.30 a.m. She told her friend Anthony that she was heading home, which she did, and made plans to meet up with him the next morning. The drinks that Sasha had that evening must have started to really impact her on her trip home. Two young women, Haley and Julia, spotted Sasha acting extremely intoxicated. They offered to share an Uber ride with her to ensure that she made it home safely. When they got to Sasha's building, Uptown Apartments, they waited as Sasha tried to use the keypad to enter the building. However, because she did not appear to have her entrance key fob, key, identification, or iPhone, she was unsuccessful. Before long, the building security officer approached the three women. After they explained Sasha's predicament, he advised that he could not let anyone into the building without identification or proof that they were a resident, nor could he allow her to sleep on the couch in the building's lobby. As they continued to talk, however, a young male resident of the building opened the outside door and allowed Sasha to enter. Haley and Julia spoke with the officer for a few minutes longer. They thanked him for his help, such as it was, and now confident that Sasha had made it safely inside, they left. Sasha failed to turn up to meet her friend Anthony the next morning. Friends had been texting and calling her, but no one was receiving a response. These friends then began to contact each other. Had anyone heard from Sasha? When no one could locate her, they went to her home to see if she would answer the door. After no response, Anthony makes a call to 911 to report his concern for her. Police arrived around 8.30 p.m. that evening to perform a welfare check. When they entered the apartment, they were struck by how tidy it was and clean. The smell of cleaning products permeated the air inside. The cabinet which held disinfectants and bleach was left open. Nothing else seemed out of place until they entered the bedroom. There, police found Sasha. She was lying on the bed, wrapped up in her comforter. Her purple shirt had been ripped from her body, and the necklace that she had been wearing was tangled up in her hair. Her body also smelt of cleaning solution. Sasha's shirt had been ripped in the front, and her trousers and underwear had been forcefully removed, leaving abrasions. Those items of clothing were missing. The autopsy would reveal that she died of asphyxiation. She had pressure applied around or directly down on her throat. She also showed signs of other injuries, bruising on her chest from several blows. The medical examiner found evidence of blunt force trauma to Sasha's head, contusions on her upper body as though she had been repeatedly punched, defensive wounds on her arms, and other contusions and abrasions consistent with somebody forcefully restraining her. Initially, an Orlando police spokesperson said that there were no signs of forced entry to her apartment. Her door could be accessed by key or security code, but both were undamaged. There were two fingerprints lifted from inside the apartment. One was on the bedside table, and the second was found on a lifted toilet seat. This detail was notably odd as Sasha lived alone. There was also an imprint of a single shoe next to her bed. DNA samples were taken from both within the apartment and from Sasha's person. The news of Sasha's death was incomprehensible to those who knew her. 
Who could possibly have wanted to hurt a well-loved and kind person like Sasha? Police began by interviewing those who were in contact with her the night before. The two Good Samaritans, Haley and Julia, were questioned. Their take on what transpired up to Sasha entering the building aligns with the timeline provided by her friends for when she left the attic club that evening. Sasha left the club around 12.30 a.m. and was still making her way home at approximately 1.45. Their account of dropping Sasha off at Uptown Place at about that time also aligns with the security guard, Stephen Duxbury. So the investigators turned to Stephen to begin piecing together Sasha's movements from about 2 a.m. onwards. Stephen Duxbury was employed by Vital Security and Investigations as a security guard. His company was contracted by Uptown Place Apartments, where Sasha lived. He had been employed at that building for about five months. Stephen is a U.S. Air Force veteran with an honorable discharge. He is married and a computer science student at a local state college. He and his wife of three years wed quickly at the courthouse right before his first deployment to Afghanistan. They were planning an official ceremony now that he had returned to civilian life. On the night before, Stephen tells police that he encounters the three girls at the entrance of the building at about 2 a.m. And where did you meet her at? I encountered her and two other females at the entrance into the building uh, at the corner of Marx and North Orange Avenue. And what did they say to you? Uh, they had told me that they had encountered the other female that was with them uh, somewhere downtown that she had been wandering around, looks kind of, you know, kind of aimlessly, and they were concerned for her well-being. So um, they had, I guess, asked her where she lived. And this is just me making assumptions here. But um, and I guess they got that out of her and they brought her here and, you know, she was trying to get into the building while I was doing a perimeter patrol and I came upon them while I did that. Did you recognize her? No. What was her physical condition? She appeared to be very intoxicated. Okay. And why do you say that? Uh, she was stumbling. She, at some points, didn't even seem to hear anyone asking her questions or even talking to her. She was like hyper-focused on what she was trying to do, which was like trying to dial herself in using the call box. Problem being, she didn't have her phone with her, so it wouldn't have worked anyway. And she didn't have any ID or her key fob that would have allowed her to gain access into the building. Stephen told police that he initially refused Sasha access to the building because without her keys or ID, she could not prove her residence there. After she was let in by the other male resident, he lets her wander in and then leaves to do a sweep of the building a few minutes later to ensure that she has either gained entry to her unit or left the building. He encounters her in one of the hallways. Sasha had tried to enter her apartment by using a digital lock on her door, but she was not able to recall the code. Stephen advised police that she told him that her key fob was in her car, so the security officer started to go with her to the building's garage. However, Sasha suddenly said she recalled the code and headed back towards her apartment. At that point, Stephen left her alone. When he passed by her door later, she was nowhere to be seen. But later that night, he sees Sasha in the building with an unknown male. Now, when did you see her again? Um, I think I saw her again at some point later on in the evening. Again, I didn't really document it because I wasn't sure, and there was nothing suspicious about what she and the gentleman I saw her with were doing. They were just walking in the hallway. Are you sure it was her? Not 100% sure because it looked like she might have been wearing something different. I couldn't tell you what, though, because, again, they weren't really doing anything out of the ordinary that I see most people when they're walking around, but it did look similar to her. Okay. With the hair and the height and the skin color. Can you describe that guy? Vaguely. I mean, Caucasian male, um, average build, either brown or sandy hair, and um, was wearing a polo and some slacks. Stephen's security log and report from the night is obtained by police's evidence and referenced against the CCTV footage inside the building. With Stephen's story seeming to make sense, the investigators turn to examining other relationships in Sasha's life. Taylor Unsinger is an ex-boyfriend of Sasha's. The two dated for a couple of years exclusively and were quite serious for a time. Taylor said the two had discussed marriage. They were no longer together, but Taylor said that their relationship remained amicable. They had many shared friends and he remained in contact with her mother. Taylor was invited in to speak with detectives. It takes a while for the interview to commence properly, as Taylor's brother is a detective, so the group makes small talk about policing and other common ground for a time before getting started. And so the last time you heard from her was Friday. Friday morning. Friday morning. Correct. About what time? 9, 9.25. It's right before I left for work. So. Okay. And you called on your cell phone? No. No. 
No, we just Facebook message. That's Facebook, just, yeah. Okay. Were there any problems? Not at all. Nope. But the relationship had ceased? Yes, sir. Just want to make sure I have this correct. You spoke to her on the 21st and that was just Facebook texting. Yes. Texting each other. But and the last time you actually saw her was at Lindsay's birthday party. It was like October 1st. That's correct. And last time you were at her apartment was September 6th. Yes. I also must ask you, did you have any involvement in murder? No, sir. Do you know who murdered No, sir. The detectives ask Taylor if he's willing to submit DNA for testing. He complies quite willingly. Benjamin Roebuck also had a romantic relationship with Sasha. The two had known each other since high school, but had started dating in their sophomore year at college. Much like Sasha's relationship with Taylor, the two had managed to continue a friendship in the aftermath of their breakup. Ben had unfortunately learned the news of Sasha's death from Facebook. He then contacted the police directly to speak with them. There had been one final text message sent from Sasha's phone late that night. It was sent to him, and it simply read, Ben. Hang out a little where I was. I was at a house with some friends. Um, and then she said, where? She, uh, I gave her the address, and she said, I'm at Sidebar. I said, just come after. I'll pay for your Uber. Just come on, I'll, uh, come on over, let me know. And then she said, Ben. And I said, Sasha, you OK? And she said, yes, of course. And that was around right around 1 o'clock. And I said, OK, we should come hang out whenever you're ready. Um, and then that was the last I heard from her until 5, 12 a.m. Okay. And then at 5, 12 was when you get Ben? Mm-hmm. And then I, I, you know, wasn't by my phone at that time, but I saw it and responded, you know, 15 minutes later and never heard. So um, then you're asking if she's sleeping and you... Yeah, that one, that one was a hard one for me to swallow after I found out. I had one of her friends had reached out to me. I was kind of worried about them as well. Which one? Which one? Uh, his name is Anthony, um, and I'd, I'd spoken with Katie as well, um, another one of her uh, co-workers. Um, but yeah, he had, he messaged me on Facebook, and I said no, I hadn't heard from her. Last I heard was you know five in the morning, and hadn't heard anything since. So I guess uh, one of them was the ones to uh, kind of call it in. But okay. did you go to her apartment? Uh, late or her apartment building inside late Friday night, early Saturday morning at all? No. Okay. Um, so we watch the cameras, we're not going to see you answering that building at all. Correct. Okay. Both Taylor and Ben agreed to provide DNA samples. They were also both extremely helpful, concerned, and genuinely nice guys. By all discernible measures, each maintained caring and healthy friendships with Sasha and felt her loss deeply. From an investigative standpoint, both also tested negative against the DNA found at the crime scene. So the case was on the verge of going cold when the police returned to the CCTV footage once more. Comparing the footage with Stephen's story, they found that Stephen was last captured on the cameras at 6.36 a.m. He had told police that his shift completed at 6 a.m., though he did linger a while afterwards in order to complete his report. But a second detail in the footage raised some red flags. Stephen was captured leaving the building carrying two bags of trash. It was not common practice for security officers contracted by the building to be assigned trash duty. So they thought, let's have another conversation with this guy. In the second interview, Stephen reiterates the same narrative provided to police in his initial statements on the day following Sasha's death. He follows her around the building as she searches for her keys or her way into her apartment. He leaves her to gain access, assumes she is successful, then later sees her with an unsuspicious man. I bring her to the door, she's there, quick punching the numbers away, trying to you know, remember what it is, and I'm just thinking to myself, God damn it. Okay, look, no. I'm gonna leave you here, keep trying to, you know, Plug away at this. When I come back, if you have not figured this out, we're going to have to do something about this, which is either she's going to have to figure out, get, get, somehow get a hold of her friend, or I'm going to be calling the PD and have them deal with her. Okay. Um, when I come back around after walking around, she's not there. So I'm like, okay, she must be in the building. She must have gotten in because I checked the building. There was no sign of her. And then later on in the evening during my patrol, I thought I saw her again with, the, with some guy. You thought you saw the same girl? Was yeah, I mean, I didn't really get a good look at her face, but the height, the hair, and the skin color was about the right, about the same thing. And again, like I said, I'd never seen this one before, so... After the casual chat, Stephen agrees to a polygraph. He does so, however, after subtly dropping a few caveats. 
He claims medical issues after being the victim of a stabbing four to five years prior. Now your medical history, medical background. Uh, so you got stabbed multiple times. Yep. Okay, and what year was that? That was in, uh, it, was, it was either 2010 or 2011. Okay, what else have you gone to the hospital for? Um, wisdom teeth removal, okay. emergency appendectomy in 2007. I had a just removed from my left wrist. Um, it was in 2012. I had a um, I had to have a kidney stone surgically removed because it was, as the doctor described it, a ball of fish hooks, and it had hooked right at the entrance to where it would have fell into the bladder. Oh, uh, that's actually something I just remember now. Um, I have actually been diagnosed as uh, having um, nerve myopathy. Is it? I, um, in this arm, but I'm pretty sure it's in both um, on the nerves on this part of the arm. But they, they assume it's just because of the way my arms rest when I'm typing at the keyboard that it's caused some heart rate so high. Oh, yeah. God damn it. I know, well, I know, I know that um, heart, heart disease runs in my family. I'm sure this is a precursor. All right, the test is about to begin. Please remain completely still and answer each question with a simple yes or no. Before this year, did you ever threaten anyone with physical harm? No. Did you cause the death of Sasha? No. Before last summer, have you ever lost control of your behavior because of your temper? No. Do you know who caused Sasha's death? No. Did you remove any items from Sasha's apartment? No. After the test is complete, the test administrator reviews the results with him. He begins by providing Stephen the basics of the process and interpretation. Interpreting the results is not complicated. Spikes indicate increased heart rate. Increased heart rate is indicative of deception. Stephen is told that certain portions relating to specific questions jump off the page. He is asked by the administrator to identify these. Whoa, look at that. Something jumped out of the out of that attention. And that one the line kind of goes up over the back. That is good, right? Yeah. Huge, right? Mm -hmm. Jumps right out at you. Mm -hmm. Is there another one that jumps real way out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one over there. Okay. And again, it goes up the bottom. Okay, all right. This one look big, bigger than this one? And bigger than that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. A little bit? No, oh, I mean, yeah. I'm okay. sorry, it's not as big as the other two. And you said the RA's big? Mm -hmm. And not so much there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got RA, R5, R3. Mm -hmm. well, these are the numbers that you've been picking on all the charts. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now, read me the question. Read the question to R3. Did you exercise the apartment that night? Read R5. Do you know who caused us to death? R7. I'm sorry, R8. Mm -hmm. Did you cause the death of Sasha? And R9. Did you remove any items in Sasha's apartment? Okay. Good job. During the second interview, police also noticed marks on Stephen's arms. Scratches and potential bite marks, which are telltale signs of defensive wounds inflicted during a struggle. To match against the shoe print found next to the bed, Stephen is asked to provide the pair of sneakers that he had worn to work that evening. The shoes that Stephen provides do not match. When his fingerprints come back as a match to the ones found on the toilet seat in the nightstand, however, he is charged with first-degree murder. After multiple statements to police that Stephen had never entered Sasha's home, he had been conclusively placed inside after all. His DNA was also a match to the sample taken from Sasha's chest. The police obtained a search warrant for his home and located another pair of sneakers. These proved to be a match to the ones at the crime scene. And Emily Sibel, grand jurors found there was enough evidence to charge 33-year-old Stephen Duxbury with first-degree murder, attempted sexual battery, and burglary. News the missing articles of clothing were never located, though the security footage that captures Stephen at 6.36 a.m. leaving the building with two trash bags, the same time-stamped clip that brought the police back around to Stephen as a person of interest, seems to offer an explanation. It was very unusual for security guards to remove trash from the building and the length of time that elapsed after Stephen entered the garage led the investigators to suggest that he may have put those bags in his car rather than throwing them away. 
It was also suggested that the bags he was carrying were a match to a box of those found in Sasha's apartment. The question remains about how Stephen managed to access Sasha's apartment that night. It was extremely unlikely that she would have voluntarily let him enter, and it was shown that she didn't. A police technician searched Stephen's smartphone and determined that somebody had done an internet search using that phone, trying to learn how to override a quick set digital lock, the type of lock on Sasha's door. That internet search was performed around 5 o'clock that morning, which coincided with a 90 minute time period during which Stephen is not seen on any video nor is location revealed by any other security related patrol data. With that particular lock, there, there are some methods to manipulate that, that open without showing any signs of forced entry. Uh, so that in, a homeowner wouldn't even know that someone got into a home uh, through that cylinder. Um, it would take a forensic locksmith to kind of point out some things. The lawsuit also notes the interior of the lock, saying this piece of plastic on the inside makes it easy for someone to break in. Armstrong says with these type locks, the way of getting in has more to do with manipulation of the lock itself rather than unlocking the key code. The Sam Sudines filed a lawsuit against Quickset Locks. The security risks had been published in an article from Wired Magazine back in 2013. The company has since redesigned the smart key deadbolt and in January 2016, after denying that there were any vulnerabilities with the locks, nonetheless changed them. A second lawsuit was filed by Sasha's parents against Vital Security, the contracting company used by Uptown Place, which employed Stephen Duxbury. In their claim, they state that the company did not perform sufficient background check. Their attorney says a thorough check would have revealed that Stephen had a criminal history and mental health issues. Vital Security said that they conducted a statewide FBI check and found that Stephen was a former member of the armed services with an honorable discharge that he was a fully licensed security guard and had passed all checks with no criminal record being returned. Stephen was given two life sentences for first degree murder and attempted rape, with an additional 15 years for a burglary conviction. Stephen fought these convictions in an appeal in 2019. His appeals were denied and Stephen remains thankfully behind bars. Thank you once again for joining me here in the lounge. My name is Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one. I get along great. Um, a lot of family members, a lot of parents were actually telling their daughters, dump your boyfriend, date him. <laughs> <laughs>